The Book Distillery, we are the Blue Collar Scholars, discussing books that matter. This week we're discussing chapter, uh, well, the epilogue of Saving Europe, and we're very privileged to be joined uh, with our special guest, Jonathan Chaplin. Let me do a quick introduction to Jonathan Chaplin, and then we'll shoot straight into this. Dr. Jonathan Chaplin is the former director of the Kirby Lang Institute of Christian Ethics, for, for Christian Ethics, Cambridge, UK, a member of the Cambridge University Divinity Faculty and has held academic posts in Toronto and Amsterdam. He is Associate Fellow of the London-based think tank Theos, also a Senior Fellow of the Canadian Christian think tank Cardus. His books include, you can hold them up down there boys, Faith in Democracy, Framing a Politics of Deep Diversity, that was last year, from 2011, Hermann Durvierd, Christian Philosophy of State and Civil Society, and his latest book coming up in just a very few weeks, May 22, Beyond Establishment, Resetting Church-State Relations in England. And that's due out, as I say, in May. There's actually a lot of other things that Jonathan has co-edited, like The Future of Brexit Britain, God and the EU, Faith in the European Project, which um, one of the contributors we've had on, our dear friend Josh Horden, and... Um, and there's a few others, but I'll, I'll leave those. Those are the ones that are most uh, salient, maybe. So, limited number of blue collar scholars. Give it up for Jonathan Chaplin. Yeah, very good to be here and uh, glad to join this conversation. That's great. Okay, so tonight, much awaited. We did a similar thing with Jeff Fountain when he was on, who stood in for Jonathan um, when he wasn't well. Just, Jonathan, you are better now, aren't you? Well on the way. Well on, well on the way. way. Good. Wow. Thank God. Um, right, OK, so we're going to be looking at the parts of Chapter 18 and also the epilogue of the Saving Europe book. And so really, I want to just kick off with this, this concept of the three-legged stool of Europe. And I wanted to know, so that is the three-legged stool on which the European project stands is the defence, NATO, the, the, the generation of, of wealth, and then also what we call the soul of Europe, this uh, the European spirit. And I I just need to check that this, how do you, do you find that? Did you find that an adequate framing, Jonathan, Richard, Ben? Was that adequate? Well, I think it's a helpful heuristic device to capture some of the major thrusts behind the creation of what has become the EU. Uh, you know, it captures quite a lot of ground. Um, so it's, it's certainly, it's a very it's a very useful sort of device for trying to map mm. broad terrain. Um, uh, it's worth perhaps pointing out that, you know, the, the economic side of those um, was present very much from the beginning. The defensive side is distinct because it's NATO related. That's not something that's been generated out of the EU yet, well, it's just beginning to emerge. Mm. And it's interesting in your book that you describe the deep frustrations of some of the early founders when the uh, initial idea of a European defense uh, arrangement was was rejected. Um, so that's a, that's a somewhat distinct pillar. You know, NATO is not the EU and obviously has to be kept quite separate from that. There are many other considerations that NATO brings onto the table that do not concern the EU and vice versa. 
Um, but on the economic side, it is worth noting that whilst you're right in the book, and I would absolutely agree that the Christian democratic inspiration expressed through people like Schumann and Adenauer and others and de Gasperi was very, very powerful and very central and really quite explicit at the beginning. So that's one of the great virtues of your book. You're joining a chorus of those who are wanting to say, you know, what you see now it, it, it's founded on something that most people have no idea of or have forgotten or have tried to suppress. So that's, that's a, a very important project you're engaged in. But alongside that was what was often called at the time sort of economic functionalism, mm. yeah. which was not idealistic and moralistic or even religious in inspiration, but was a sort of hard-headed kind of pragmatic attempt to bind nations together by, um, as it were, um, committing them to share economic functions, such as production of coal and steel and, mm. and so forth. And later on, of course, that's vastly expanded uh, into you know the whole single market apparatus um, and that's a different kind of motivation and inspiration and it was there from the beginning I think it was always problematic in its conception um, you know what we really needed was a, a Christian democratic economic model which we didn't quite get at the beginning um, and has only ever been patchily realized um, but anyway, what your mm. you know that is one of the that one of the three pillars was there, but it, it has this problematic problematic dimension, I think, from from the beginning. If you're happy, I don't mind talking about that because I would be really interested to think about that now. What was problematic? I suppose that's the question I'd ask. Would that be a good question to to, to take it from, Jonathan? Yeah. So, uh, you know, what, what was called at the time sort of neo-functionalism was this notion that um, you, know, you, you, as it were, integrate societies by means of tying them into um, societal functions that are somehow necessary for for the uh, operation and, and uh, you know, survival and sustenance of a system. So it's, it's based in a kind of systems thinking, which I think is, is somewhat problematic. Uh, and there's a kind of automaticity assumption in it that if you build in these sort of shared functional ties that somehow other cultural, even moral ties might follow in due course. Now, you know, that's not necessarily the case mm. at all. Um, and I think the limits of that kind of neo-functionalism became very evident actually after the creation of the single market in the uh, you know 80s and 90s. And there was this very considerable expansion of EU level competence in regulating, um, uh, you know, uh, economic exchange across across the membership, um, and it was a, a huge push towards that kind of integration. With the, without realizing that it would going it was going to create new pressures that the political structures were not ready for, and more importantly, that the electorates were not ready to embrace. And hence, from that time especially, you get this cry coming up that, you know, Europe is a remote bureaucratic imposition. I mean, often misleadingly so and distortedly so, but nonetheless, that was the widespread perception. And you know, it, it was, in a sense, pushing that third pillar without mm. recognizing that, you know, the, the, the other pillar, what, what you want to call mm. sort of more religious foundation or spiritual foundation, uh, you know, the soul of Europe's side, uh, also needed to be boosted and spelled out and elaborated in order to create kind of the moral solidarity needed mm. for that kind of economic integration. And that was never done. Hence, you know, Delors launched the Soul for Europe project, which frankly did not achieve very much at all. Um, and, you know, it's unfinished business. And indeed, that's one of the key themes of your book rightly so mm -hmm. so uh, you know one of the reasons why we need to deepen that sort of cultural analysis and come up with solutions to the sort of cultural disunity and, and, and moral fragmentation of uh, of the eu is because we've pushed ahead with that sort of economic functionalism without mm -hmm. uh, addressing that there was a remarkable statement in uh, around about 2004 um called uh, from memory something like the moral and spiritual dimension of europe um mm. i should i should send you that link if you don't have it 
produced by a couple of dozen very senior uh, EU statesmen, thinkers, and, and intellectuals, um, which states this with remarkable um, perspicuity uh, and uh, you know acuity, and it, it hit the nail right on the head uh, mm. uh, as regards to the you know the, the the uneven development of these different pillars, so to speak. Um, economic integration rushing ahead, producing all kinds of consequences which the, the moral and spiritual dimension could not really cope with because it was it was underfed and it was neglected. Um, so that's, that was a very important statement actually, which uh, in the revised version of your book, yeah, yeah, yeah. published, really, not, really ought to get a mention. Absolutely, yeah. That's so that's what I mean by that. Because yeah. it's happening, it's not just happening in Europe, as well, per se, this is happening in the late modern world across Western countries as well. And there's this chapter we did with, um, in the book, chapter 18, I think it is, about um, really taking what's the author scholar from Baylor called, who wrote that beautiful book, The Year of Our Lord, 1943. Um, what and a Jacobs. Book. What a great book. Yeah. Um, anyway, but he. There was this sort of worry amongst Christian thinkers in the interwar years about about the size of the technocratic enterprise, and, and I think Richard, did you want to add anything to this this idea of of, of neo functionalism and economics rushing ahead within and sort of uh, really forming a kind of ideological capture almost within the EU institutions and well. Um, I be I had a question which gets the answer that to think with yeah. Jonathan. Jonathan, having worked through your faith in democracy, you've often said, you've hinted repeatedly that you're critical of neoliberalism and what you see as a neoliberal hegemony or basic, you know, in politics um, across Europe. Um, and but you're also critical of other models, the, the state-led model as well as the market-led model. So. What would you say, um, can you point us to any resources or framework to understand what would be a distinctively, a distinctive economic policy for Christian democracy? Well, okay, that's a big question. Uh, so, I mean, a few hints. Um, you know, when I said earlier that what the EU needed as foundation was a much more fully worked out Christian democratic model of the market economy. Yeah. Um, the first thing to say there is that, in fact, you know, certain countries did already have quasi uh, um, social market economies, Germany especially. I mean, it used that specific term. Yeah. Um, that was a very powerful model in the early post war period. And it was partly formed by, but well, it was a synthesis of Christian democracy and what was called at the time ordo liberalism, which was a kind of precursor to neoliberalism, you could say, a version of classical liberalism, a kind of moralized version of classical liberalism. And uh, there's a chapter in the, in the book, God in the EU, by a German economist who describes exactly that model. Now, he's quite favorable to it, very interestingly, and he sees it as a a really a very authentic expression of Christian social and economic ethics. You know, I have my questions about that because I think it's far too influenced by um, uh, a classical liberal version of uh, economics. So, so there was that school and that also influenced, you know, other EU nations like Austria and, and, and so forth. But at the same time, you know, the Christian Democrats did produce other other variants. So in Belgium and the Netherlands, for example, there were more what you might call socially oriented versions of the market, I think, which um, I find more attractive. I mean, they, they fell short in various ways as well. You know, not, none of these trajectories is exemplary in every respect. All of them have shortcomings and all of them were, of course, the result of coalition governments. So, you know, there was there was almost never a single Christian democratic government which didn't have to compromise with either liberals, classical liberals or modern liberals, more secular liberals um, or conservatives. So you never get the sort of um, the, the, the undiluted Christian democratic model. And, and at the time, of course, that itself was being 
you know, in development, and it was partial, it was fragmentary. People were working out of a vision, but um, having to invent things on the hoof, so to speak, you know, with changing circumstances. But that background sets, you know, said, um, nonetheless, you could say that the were then, and certainly there still are today, distinctive emphases of a, of a Christian democratic economic model, which are not simply a synthesis of classical liberalism and social democracy. That, that's how it's often appeared from the outside. Indeed. Um, and for reasons I've indicated, but already in the beginning of the 20th century, right from well the 1920s or 30s at least there were especially catholic economists uh, working out of some of the official encyclicals um you know going back to the 19th yeah. century uh rerum novarum but in particular quadragesimo anno in 1931 which in my view is one of my favorite encyclicals but is widely underrated and misunderstood it's seen as a kind of charter for state corporatism even fascism which is a, which is a fundamental mistake <laughs> both intellectually and historically um, it has its flaws but it was attempting to point towards um, a genuinely um, pluralist and properly corporatist kind of economic model in which there was a a, a proper judicial ba a, a judicious balancing between those three three or four sectors the state the role of the state the role of the individual the role of the market um, yeah. You know, an open market economy is very much part of that model, uh, but also a very strongly um, associationist thrust in which different economic institutions, businesses, large and small, uh, trade unions, crucially, cooperatives on the edges of the movement. You know, I wish they'd been more central to the movement, but certainly they were there on the edges of the movement. Each would play a distinctive contributory role to a, a sort of balanced economy you know to, to talk of a mixed economy is a crude generalization what you're talking about yeah. here is a complex pluralistic economy which has multiple entities each contributing their distinctive good including for example professional associations yeah. uh, employers associations and uh, and so forth um so the, the you know the, the upshot of that is that each of those institutions plays their distinctive role so it, most christian democrats like agreed with social democrats that the state had a fundamental guarantor function uh, because it was obliged to protect public justice or the common good depending on the language you used um, and that required it to intervene to you know through tax and spend policies through creations of, of welfare arrangements educational systems health systems and so forth to secure um not necessarily provide but to secure um basic minima in terms of fundamental human and social needs for the sake of human dignity so that all were part of you know all were get all individuals and families and and, and, and classes were given adequate um uh, public and social respect for example um so th so that was one of the roles of the state um but also you know the economy itself that businesses themselves were not simply supposed to go gung-ho in a sort of capitalist um, um, trajectory, expecting the state to pick up the social tab. On the contrary, they were expected, um, this, is the, this is Christian democracy at its best, they were expected to build social ethics and social responsibility into their internal operations. Well, um, and uh, and uh, the more that they were able to do that, then the less the state would have to do to compensate the shortcomings. Mm. Of, of the market but at the same time individuals and households were expected to be responsible um, and, and you know had all those things been fully fleshed out and widely practiced then you would have had at least you know a less um uh, gratuitous slide into inequality consumerism hedonism environmental damage and, and so forth so that's just to give a very few broad brush strokes to sketch what you know the priorities of a Christian democratic economic model might look like today um, you know in the UK we have this group this movement called blue labor yeah um, which is partly influenced by that trajectory by that by that tradition even though it doesn't 
name its source as Christian democracy. Um, and one of the one of the, uh, the the deeper sources here is the School of Civil Economy that's come out of Italy. Um, uh, a, a number of leading thinkers uh, who have developed a very distinctive school of economic thought, which I believe has affinity with and, and breathes the spirit of that early Christian democratic model, but is attempting to re, you know re-express it for a new new context. Yeah. Mm. I've wondered whether the varieties of capitalism model in economics would be helpful um, because they've talked about more than two, um, they started with two, but the, do you know, are you familiar with varieties of capitalism as a research program? Uh, no, tell me about it. Well, it started with some economists coming out with some solid e indicators for comparing different forms of capitalism. That's why it's called varieties of capitalism. And they started by distinguishing American capitalism from German capitalism, um, which I found really interesting in relating to the political heritage, the sort of political heritage of political philosophy in the two traditions. And uh, varieties of capitalism started with just two, um, and it's gradually broadened to thinking at least three, maybe four, and multiple varieties of capitalism. Yeah. And it's basically been um, gr grounding different models of how capitalism works in different political cultures, in different national traditions, um, but thinking in a transnational way. And uh, I just wondered if, but if, if you're not familiar with it, then you won't, as you're the expert on the politics, you won't be able to connect it. Um, but I did have a question on, you know, in the 90s, we had the movement for Christian democracy in this country. Um, mm -hmm. I was there at the House of Lords when it was launched in 91, I think it was, and uh, it so was- So was I. Yeah, oh right, we were both in the same room, yeah. <laughs> and it was exciting, Sandy Miller was there and it was really getting, it was exciting. And, um, but it didn't, uh, and I was fascinated by your observation in Faith and Democracy, um, linking to Henry's book. Henry's book is very much the backstory of the Christian democratic movement, at least that half of his book is that. And, um, uh, and the um, movement for Christian democracy, I loved your point that we didn't really need the Christian Democrat movement in this country because there was um, less secularism in a way that all three political traditions had strong Christian roots and strong links to the Christian witness, yeah? Um, it was the point you made, and I thoroughly agree because when I was involved in MCD, I thought, yes, a cross-party renewal of Christian po of politics in this country by Christians on all sides, um, that was really exciting. Um, and. That's when I was involved in Parliament, when we met in London, you know, I was, that was my passion was to get the three traditions working together, acknowledging their own Christian heritage. And there were three groups who are now vaguely linked through the Bible Society, um, insisting on those traditions. But it was quite frustrating getting Tories to read and getting Labour to talk about more than just a narrow perception of history and, and uh, getting the Liberal Democrats to, well, just to, for there to be enough of them to talk to. So. Um, I was wondering what what became of what what do you see the movement for Christian democracy as um, part of the wider Christian democratic movement in Europe? And and second question is what happened to it? Well, certainly when it was founded, it intentionally positioned itself as part of the wider European Christian democratic movement. Those were its principal sources, for sure. Um, uh, particularly from the side of the catholic leaders who understood their own tradition yeah. um, you know evangelical leaders it was mainly catholic and evangelical evangelical leaders of course didn't have such a tradition to rely on um a, a few people like alan storkey and myself you know would would rely on the reform tradition the neo-calvinist tradition, but that was quite quite small so there was there was certainly a, a, an infusion of Christ, christian democratic thinking while at the same time some inventing things on the hoof. Um, but yeah, that was certainly where it was positioning itself. Now, of course, already by the 1990s, the much of the energy and inspiration and authenticity of the post-war Christian democratic vision had diminished very substantially in Christian democratic parties across, across, yeah. the, across Europe. And you said that in your book, yeah. You know, there were allies that we could find but um, they were not generally among the mainstream established Christian Democrat parties, Christian Democrat parties who by then had be 
become pretty secular, pretty secularized, yeah, and that yeah. process has continued. Right. So we found ourselves talking, for example, to you know some Croatian Christian Democrats, you know the new East European Christian Democrats. I think possibly some of the Scandinavians who who are more conservative uh, it, than than the mainstream. So um, yeah, nonetheless, it was an attempt to say here's here. You know, here are our roots. This is what we want to work out of. And it was a promising initiative. But, um, well, I think it ran up against a number of things. One was the point you exactly made, which is that it is extremely difficult to get people who are already committed to a, a mainstream political party to think outside their boxes. And that remains the case today. Um, you know, as, as long as MCD was not fighting elections, um, there was no reason why committed members of other political parties shouldn't join in, but they were often very, very reluctant to do so. Uh, partly because, certainly on the left, um, Christian democracy was just seen as conservative, and therefore it would have been tainting to be associated with it. And on the right, um, Christian democracy was seen as conservatism. So why did conservatives need it? Oh, really? I was, um, I've always thought of it as more on the liberals on the left rather than Tory. Uh, well, I mean, you know, that, that yeah. Uh, t t traditionally, it was attempting to provide a third way between those, those yeah. two models, or really a fourth way between conservatism, socialism, and, and liberalism. Yeah. Um, and at its best, it did do that. There were stretches of time, movements, parties, even periods in government where Christian Democrats really did try to live up to that vision. Um, but of course, it was only ever partially realized. So that was one reason. You know, there was this deep um, reluctance among people who had already committed themselves to another political party to associate with it and, and then to do the thinking that MCD was challenging them to do. And, I have to say, although there's been a considerable development, uh, often positive, in Christian participation in political parties, I don't think that situation has fundamentally changed. Uh, I think that Christians who are already committed to political parties um, do not have the institutional and intellectual freedom to engage in the kind of rigorous Christian self-critique and reconstruction that will be needed to, as it were, really take that radical Christian democratic vision forward. Um, it's it's amazing how quickly people get caught in these intellectual institutional ruts. Um, yeah. It's very difficult to get people out of them. And so, for example, the, th the, th the three main Christian groups within the main three political parties in the UK, full of great people doing some great work all over the place, you know, uh, exemplary people in many respects, but almost no trace of serious Christian based policy thinking. Yeah. I mean, uh, and so that's continues to be the case. But it seems to me what was needed was a sort of um, a base in in near Westminster with a proper policy unit, a think tank needed to come out. That's, yeah, that's what didn't seem to happen. Yeah, I mean, you know, a number of Christian-based think tanks have emerged over the years, like oh, yeah. Centre for Social Justice on the conserv you know conservative compassionate conservatism. Uh, Res Publica, which is kind of yeah. red Tory. There isn't really a blue Labour think tank per se, but th there's that movement. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, Theos is is wonderful, but doesn't do that sort of detailed yeah. policy work. So there is a lacuna there, and uh, I, you know, I would love to hear people's suggestions as to how that kind of project could get launched. It's it's very difficult to see how it could get going in present. Well, because things haven't, it's, it's sort of run into the ground after 15 years, and then there was the Christian People's Alliance Party um, was set up, and I briefly got involved with them. I wrote their education manifesto. All oh, right, yeah, and got to know some of the council. But as I dug a bit into the council CPA, who have now fizzled, I believe. Um, I, the, the problem was church disunity, that basically there was no shared Christian mind, like yeah. Harry Blair Myers used to say. So the problem was on fundamental issues of, you know, moral issues, biblical interpretation issues, 
there was no consensus. So the council couldn't come to a coherent policy because the churches were so divided. Um, so they were all saying different things, like on the hot, on the hot potato issues under New Labour. This was 2006, I think. So, yeah, there was just a, there was no consensus on gay issues, on Islam, on so many things that were current at the time, and so they couldn't come up with a coherent platform. So I did my best to come up with an education policy proposal, but what worried me was that it was a vacuum. I, I wrote it, and they said, "Yes, we like that. We'll stick it in," and they put it in their national manifesto for that year without briefing. So it wasn't really a functional party. But also, I thought, you know what? I watched them in elections, and I thought. I agreed with the MCD's principle. It's actually more effective for us to be cross-party. It's harder because you're leveraging much, something much larger, but it's much more difficult to work cross-party, but much more effective in the long run. And um, as Henry's book shows, you know, these guys are heroic. Yeah, I was going to mention that, but this would be a good segue, really. I mean, and so we're talking about this this deep well that Schumann and the confidence that they got from Quadrocino Animo and um, Rerum Navarum and so forth, that they came from a like a deep well of confidence in their own, you know, they sort of almost came fully formed, you know, <laughs> onto the scene. About being these sort of, uh, what I call it, les personnes de frontier. If, if you guys chatting amongst yourselves now, if just imagine there are young Christians, young people listening and thinking, well, I'd like to get involved in politics. Now, most of us are working at upstream, uh, downstream, but for those people with the call into that sphere, um, ben perhaps has that call, and I think Richard has, in a, in a way, to be involved in that way. I don't think I have, but how would you change things now? What would you do if you had your bucket list? You've just talked about a think tank for a um, for, for for a Blue Labour type think tank. Is then could you just sort of start to talk around? Mm. You know what I mean? For the just think well, about the well, 20th millennials well, now. I was trained in Richard Russell's church in Bath and. You know, Jonathan and many other Christian, and Paul Marshall and other brilliant Christian minds in politics and other areas of the arts um, and uh, academia and so many. I was, I was, I had a very privileged start as a Christian surrounded by this stuff. But there was a tendency in the in that reformational neo-Calvinist um, tradition that's been that Jonathan mentioned. Um, that's also where he and I are both coming from um, to sidestep the church and the renewal of the church because they're, they're so fed up with Catholic and evangelical obsession with the kingdom is the church and that's all that matters, missions and running churches is the kingdom. And so I was brought up saying, no, 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 there's so much more, there's economics, there's the fact, you know, there's all these areas of society. But the problem is if you sidestep the renewal of the church, um, it's gradually dawned on me, you can't, there's so much you can't achieve politically. Um, like I've been thinking about, well, two things I could say about that. Um, in Jonathan's book, Faith in Democracy, which I found just uh, really helpful and interesting, but it's quite sobering because it makes me see that the churches are often the barrier that Christians are, what Christians are being taught or not being taught in their churches. It doesn't just affect, it affects their voting habits, it affects the, the, the sort of democratic gossip that they generate um, and their interests. and that you need to crack that because what I found I, when I was at university, I tried to start a sort of all of life redeemed group. We called it Arena. I was running it with the son of the guy who runs um, Labrie in this country. So we had quite similar starting points because um, Labrie has some similar roots to my school. And, and um, But it failed because all these young evangelicals, I made my speech at the Christian Union and they all said, yes, yes, all of life redeemed, what a great vision. Yes, yes, you must do this, wonderful, wonderful. But they didn't vote with their feet, they didn't come. And the, the, the thing fizzled because there wasn't enough actual interest. And I realized it's because we were working against the churches. These kids were being preached a very narrow, what we would call dualistic preaching. So they were being told that, you know, the kingdom of God is all about what you do at church and your personal morality and family life. It's not about the public realm. And so they couldn't, re they didn't really have the mental equipment. So I, you know, I was working against a massive, problem in the churches. And a, little, a wider illustration is the Trump phenomenon. What, I mean, um, Johnson's made it very clear in here how appalled he is by the Trump phenomenon. But um, I, watching that, and it's had big implications for evangelicals in this country. Lots of us have had a big rethink <laughs> watching the last six years. But um, it, it made me think, you know, one of the major drivers behind the Trump phenomenon in American democracy 
has or anti-democratic in a way um, movement has been that it is it's the churches that people vote for this stuff because they've had terrible teaching that they're they're being totally disempowered by their pastors and also their pastors are quite like trump so they've got a model of authority of this sort of you know chauvinist idiot in charge who tells them the truth and so it's very easy for them to project that onto a political figure because they've seen it in the microcosm um i'm sorry that you can't what, believe what solutions come on i'm looking for inspiration and solutions yeah but i'm just saying I, yeah, yeah. But one of the encouragements is that jonathan and i are both well i certainly think of myself as a my mentor is richard russell and he's had a huge effect on jonathan's life i believe and richard said that all of his protégés over the years. They've either gone to the States and been academics, it's very hard to be a Christian academic here, or they've um, mm. they've stayed in this country and become vicars. And so he's been gradually seeding the church with hopefully more wholesome teaching that will shape more coherent discipleship in the public sphere. So in a way, an answer has revealed itself. Yeah. You know? um, but I think church, what I'm saying is, I just think Alan and the, and the gang that mentored me, I think they did tend to sidestep the renewal of the church, and I think you can't. That's that's the point I make. So let me start, I recognize all of that. Let me start by saying that the situation today, for 35 years on from when I started out my journey, a little bit before you guys did, um, has changed fundamentally in, in so many respects. So, you know, the, the the vision that was, and the strategy, insofar as there was one, that was espoused by people like Richard and others 30, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, um, has had to evolve. I mean, it, it, the situation, the landscape's changed. So, so there are some positives. So it, it is the case that there is a vastly greater um, availability of what you might call, in a generic sense, public theology than yeah. there was mm -hmm. then. Yes. And often pretty good public theology, uh, not just hopeless, platitudinous, wishy-washy stuff, but quite serious public <laughs> theology, political theology, social theology, you know, going under different names here. Um, you, you know, you can study this stuff at university in Britain now, which was very, very difficult, you know, 35 years ago. You don't have to go across to the States of Canada. Mm. Um, it's, it's very broad, it's very eclectic. You know, of course, it, it's not rooted in one tradition, can't be, because it's based in universities, but there is an awful lot more out there. So a number of the people that are active, for example, in, let's say, Theos or in Christians in politics, um, you know, including MPs, a number of Christian MPs have been formed by these offerings that have been, uh, either they've studied this at university or they, you know, the spillover effect has, has has helped them and uh, these networks are now introducing younger people younger budding activists into some of the resources um you know if you look at the, the theos has produced in the last uh, 10 to 20 years produced um i don't know 50 odd or more reports some of which are really meaty attempts to address issues like economics, law, welfare, and so forth. So you know, we are in a different landscape. And I think we have to start by being positive about that, yeah. embracing that, appreciating it, you know, building on it, working with such groups to um, offer our own contributions and, you know, and learn from it as well. And, you know, Catholic social teaching has progressed as well. I mean, there were a number of, there've been a number of stunning social encyclicals in the last 35 years, from John Paul II right through to, to, to Francis, which of course don't get down to the level of policy detail as such, but which um, are, are really invaluable resources. And, and also some Anglican statements as well, and Methodist statements. I mean, th there is good work out there that we have to affirm and build on, even, even though as we critically in, engage with it, um, but it, the, the the problem, if you think it's a problem, is its dispersal and lack of coherence. So it, it doesn't have institutional focus. It doesn't have intellectual coherence, and it certainly doesn't have any shared policy implication. Uh, and, and there aren't really channels for that to emerge. So it, it's. There's some great work, but it's very dispersed. It's often quite ad hoc, uh, quite undeveloped uh, and highly decentralized. Now, 
there are people out there, some of my friends and colleagues, who would say, all to the good. Yeah. We don't want all this stuff concentrated in a single center. You know, no. here the fear of centralization and hierarchy kicks in big time. And that's a very English thing. You know, English people especially are individualistic, both personally and associationally. So they love the fact that there are a thousand different bodies and outfits and units and, and projects out there. And they don't want it all brought together in any kind of... So there's quite a bit of resistance to that idea. So one has to tread carefully in that regard in in, in challenging it. You know, the, the goal is not to have a centralized hierarchical authority that's going to um, orchestrate all this stuff in a single direction. That will never happen and we don't want it to happen. But what we can do, I think this is what you know, Richard was hinting at earlier, is to just build better networks and, and, and um, alliances um, in order to, well, attempt to start conversations that currently are not happening and attempt yeah. to take conversations further than, than is currently the case. That could, for example, involve creating a new think tank. I mean, there is certainly a market for more Christian-based think tanks in the UK. For goodness sake, we don't have that many. You know, there's a, there's, there's a thousand of them in the US, many of them way off beam from my point of view, but nonetheless, they have the resources, they have the vision, they have the organization here. We, we could do with another three or four of those that could complement the existing ones. And then maybe, you know, the next generation, um, my grandchildren, your children might might see it as their task as bringing those new entities together into some sort of more coherent platform, but it's going to be slow, incremental and, and you know, ad hoc work. Mm. Um, I had a question talking. I, I want to move on from economics, but I go back to it for the last time. Um, in the 90s, we had the third way movement, Clinton, Blair, Schroeder, all representing an attempt at a claimed third way. Um, of course, Keynes was offering originally a third way in economics because he was a liberal trying to rescue liberalism, wasn't he? And he wasn't, uh, he was trying to rescue liberalism from classical, the classical individualistic model and from communism. But um, the third way seemed to be a, a fresh attempt to come up with a third model. Do you, do you see what connection, Jonathan, do you see between third way politics of the 90s? Because I wondered if that's a failed experiment. I wondered if it came to power too quickly before it had really thought itself through, um, was my general conclusion. But um, is it connected to the movement for Christian democracy and for Christ to, to Christian democratic politics? Do you see a connection between that and third way 25 years ago? Hardly at all, uh, oh. if at all. Um, no, I mean, that was a, a sort of essentially secular political strategy that emerged um, out of a recognition that you know, Thatcherite neoliberalism was incapable of providing the sort of basic equality, security, fraternity, solidarity, you could say, that you know society needed and that its version of libertarian capitalism was fracturing society and corroding society so that it was a reaction to that um, without lapsing back into the kind of uh, uh, managerialist uh, directive yeah. of socialism or social democracy that had also started to fail very patently by the 1970s and 80s you know top-down bureaucratic welfare states that dehumanized uh, people um, uh, or that frustrated enterprise, quite frankly, you know, was sort of t uh, overly over heavy taxation, heavy regulation, pop down kind of regulation. So it was it was it emerged out of that realization that the two predominant models of both were producing very serious negative consequences for society as a whole and failing, increasingly failing. Um, now. There is a certain affinity there with the best of the Christian democratic vision. Um, but in my view, you know, the sort of secular third way of Blair and Clinton was you know, a classic compromise between two incompatible models. Oh, good, yeah. it, never really, it never really produced an integrated, coherent, unified vision. Thank you. Along the sort of Christian democratic lines I was, I was suggesting. Um, and that's what uh, uh, movements like Blue Labour, for example, or, you know, or Red Toryism, um, 
are attempting to do today. They're attempting to, as it were, pick up again this sort of aspiration of an alternative model, but without simply stopping at an unsatisfactory and unstable compromise between two inadequate alternatives. Um, and, uh, you know, I think all of them in different ways are attempts to express a, a pluriform, pluralistic, uh, kind of complex kind of social and political and economic ecology uh, that neither of those two traditions have adequately um, uh, honoured or, or, or captured. That's really, I think, the, the, what they're trying to do at their best. Um, you know, there are problems with all of them, but that's... So, yeah, it's something... Dis I, I think a Christian Democrat third way, on a on its best day, is not simply a rehashed or sacralized version of Blairism, for goodness sake. Good, thank you. I, 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 I agree. <laughs> it was yeah. just nice to hear you articulate it. Thank you. So there was the third way was a political strategy, but it hadn't really thought things through root and branch. So it ended up falling into one or the other. Yeah, I mean, it was a sort of uneasy compromise between the two. And, um, you know, if you look back at sort of Blair's third way, so one of its central strategies was the reform of public services. So this was the social democratic aspiration to provide better public services to people in health, education and, and, and so forth. A, a commendable aspiration, you know, an agenda that's still hugely urgent and, and unfulfilled. Um, but it did it by, well, a sort of eclectic mix of initiatives that didn't really cohere. So on the yeah. one hand, there was a kind of Mar introduction of market disciplines into public services, a la Thatcher, that was kind of honoring the Thatcherite vision, uh, which has led to, you know, this weird combination of um, uh, um, kind of state-led regulation on the one hand and um, social fragmentation on the other. Yeah. So it's treated people as individuals individual recipients of yes. state benefits, uh, but has not, as it were, attempted to rebuild or reconstruct or renew the social ecology yes. that yes. is absolutely indispensable if vulnerable individuals are to be restored to a position of dignity. And so, you know, it's the classic neglect of civil society of intermediate structures on the one hand. Yes. So the state can fix things, not necessarily by putting money in your pocket, but by... Uh, <laughs> administering itself along more market-based lines. Yeah. Well, well that, you know, I, what you said is exactly what Philip Blond says, the guy who founded Respublica. Yeah, that's, yeah. His, that's exactly his critique. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And a critique also of uh, the same sources is, you know, that we are facing here um, two quite distinct tracks of liberalism. There's economic liberalism, there's a Thatcherite kind, and then there's the social and cultural liberalism. Yeah. Um, of the progressive left. Um, now, I, I don't reject entirely all of those. That, that's too simplistic. But 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 these are two versions, uh, uh, applications of liberalism that are philosophically continuous, but practically uh, intention. Uh, you know, the one sort of undermines the other, and and it cannot lead to, I think, a coherent vision or program. That, that was the problem with David Cameron's government. I would have said it was trying to combine those two. Yeah, for example, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm also interested in law because Henry talks about the three-legged stool, but it struck me that instead of just three, there's a whole spectrum of, of um, things going on. Um, yeah. And it might be better, Henry, to think of it as a hierarchy with culture higher up in the hierarchy. Um, but I'm saying that, Jonathan knows because I'm, where I'm coming from, from the Dutch school. But um, I was thinking about law. Um, I've been studying a really interesting legal theorist called Alex Stone Sweet. Have you come across him, Jonathan? No. Uh, he's he's very good. He's all about finding the uh, look at the philosophical roots of European law um, uh, in a very rigorous way. And like your book, Faith in Democracy, he's applying it to case studies in law now around the world and especially in Europe. And uh, and he was I loved what he had to say about. The, if we think in terms, in American terms, of the three branches of government, which you also articulate in your book, um, he says the, the judicial branch of government can actually act as a sort of Trojan horse for a wider 
liberal democratic model. Um, and he shows how that's happened, to start with in Eastern Europe since the expansion of the EU. He says that the, the expansion of the European Court of Human Rights and the Convention to the East in Eastern Europe has actually helped to train those cultures in legal practices which are normal in Western Europe, obviously still under review as your book shows, but um, and help them to work out what, and as you start, as you, if you start developing the courts and the relationship between courts um, in, in accordance with the Western European or Central European model, um, it's amazing how that boosts the liberal democratic model in other areas of government. Um, and he was showing how, how because, because if you start with the expansion of the legal model, you actually end up with legislative and executive change. Um, I just thought I'd mention that because it's relevant to Henry's um, book on movement. The expansion of the, move, of the Christian democratic movement eastward is a real interest of mine. Um, so what, because the, the consciousness that my generation was brought up in was very Western European, you know, that because of the Iron Curtain, we were kind of blind to Eastern Europe, um, you know, including right back to Constantinople, we just didn't know, I wasn't taught that stuff. And then as an adult, I've discovered it and thought, wow, this, this is massive, this is so important to European history. And Henry, to his credit, does bring it into saving Europe several times. He's mainly focusing on the West, but he does keep bringing in the fact that but there's an east, but there's an east, um, and there's a there's a backstory. And of course, with the current news that we're watching every day, um, that's become very relevant because the orthodox story is is you know is suddenly intruding into the Western Western consciousness in a whole new way. I, I want to talk about um, NATO and the military as well, if you don't mind later. But I had some questions about that. But I, I just thought I'd mention Stone Sweet's insight because it seemed to me an exciting model of how to spread. Um, how to spread democratic governance and accountable government. You can do it through more than just the, the means that we often try. Yes, I'll, I'll try to be brief on this. I mean, that's another huge agenda. Um, so various things. So I think you're right in your observation, for sure. Um, perhaps one shouldn't rejoice unqualifiedly uh, such a development in the sense that you know we do not want the judiciary to be leading the charge in social and political change that is not the function of the judiciary no. that's the function of uh, democratic bodies such as you know parliaments and governments answerable to them so i mean there is the there is the worry widespread worry about you know what americans call judicial activism right or overt judicial legislation. Um, now, one can be too reactive against that because judges always are incrementally developing the law in pretty much every judgment they make because they're applying it to new contexts, to new situations, to new facts. So there's nothing wrong with the judicial development, specification, clarification of, of the law, but that's, that's a secondary mode of legal change. Uh, it should be at least the primary mode should be legislation through democratic elected parliaments. Um, and of course, one of the reasons why. So, in, in you mentioned Eastern Europe, very interesting indeed. You know, in places like Hungary and Poland, you have conservative, or sometimes they call themselves Christian democratic parties in government, who are now reacting very aggressively against that kind of legal transformation that's being imported from from western legal systems or via the european uh, cause of human rights for example um you know that's exactly what's happened in in uh, in both those countries you know and victor orban who who claims to be a christian democrat but in fact isn't um is much more conservative nationalist yeah. is reacting against all of that and and one has so while i don't you know i'm critical of of that kind of Christian nationalism in, in those two countries and elsewhere uh, for all sorts of reasons. Nonetheless, one of the reasons why it's emerged is because of this perception, at least, that there is this kind of judicial culture being exported from the West, which okay. is alien to what the people in those countries really want. So there's an issue there that needs to be, mm -hmm. uh, be uh, addressed. And bear in mind as well that the European Court of Human Rights is, is, is distinct from the EU. You know, the yeah. EU has its own internal judicial system. Uh, Europe, the Court of 
uh, European Court of Justice, um, they are increasingly being integrated because the EU has for a number of years now been formally committed to the European Convention on Human Rights. So members have to be, you know, signatories to that. Um, but nonetheless, the European Court of Human Rights is straddles a much larger range of countries uh, and has its own autonomous movement and development and, and culture, which is not simply an expression of the uh, EU. Mm. That's fascinating. We've seen the sort of uh, the, the rushing ahead of um, a sort of neo-functionalist economic systems and the rushing ahead of the judiciary. Uh, gosh, a lot to think on there. I, I do want to move on to this, the idea of um, because we, 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 yeah, we, we, we've gone over the hour mark now. So let's start to sort of look toward the end game. We, we, we this episode's recorded in probably I think day 28, 29, is it, of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. So that the, right from the inset, as we probably mentioned right at the beginning of the European project, there was a, a strong call for a European defence force. In fact, it was one of the last things de Gasperi was thinking as he um, was making phone calls from his deathbed. And some people were very against what they called the, Atl the Atlanticist view, which was the bringing in of America, which is, of course, what happened. So things have happened in the last three weeks that have maybe made a, a great game change to that. And I noticed this, this Europhile um, publication was really, in a sense, talking about as if the soul of Europe had suddenly been restored because there was a common enemy suddenly. And then that, you know, and then the moves from Germany, which were quite exceptional um, in terms of, you know, taking their own defence more seriously. So, you know, there's, there's sort of dangers and there's perhaps opportunities. I'd love to hear you all as you have obviously been thinking and watching and researching this. So, first of all, Jonathan, uh, do you want to just talk about the, 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 how you understand the, the defence aspects from the last, you know, historically and now, and so we get a good, a better view than I just gave, anyway, put it that way. Yeah, I'll have a stab. It's not my main area of, of research and thinking, but I'll have a go. Um, but just to put down a marker, I'd love to come back to the very idea of soul of Europe before we finish, because I think there's important things to say about that. Yeah, fine. And I've got some responses to your, your book on that. Okay. Um, so, I mean, you're quite right to observe that it's far too premature to suggest that because Russia has invaded Ukraine, all of a sudden, you know, the soul of Europe is going to be revived. I mean, this is this is illusory. Um, certainly there has emerged a very pronounced and powerful European-wide solidarity, uh, which is expressing itself in military support, you know, widespread military support for Ukraine. And well, I mean, I'm I'm essentially supportive of that. You know, I'm not a pacifist. I think Ukraine has a right to defend itself against this monstrous aggression. Um, and so I'm principally in favor of European countries, um, you know, helping, helping Ukraine to defend itself as best it can. Um, so what I mean, what is what is going on here? Well, so on the one hand, this is further confirmation, is it not, that you know nationalism, which thinkers at the end of the 20th century, um, by the fall of communism, you know, predicted was on its way out. The sort of end of history thesis, mm. what the end of history meant. You know, these kind of uh, um, primitive nationalist um, uh, impulses uh, would finally die, and we'd all find sweet agreement under liberal consumerism. So that was pretty quickly falsified, but this is another, as it were, revenge of the gods uh, on, on a very large scale in Europe. I mean, it's just kind of no surprise. So people are talking about the Russian invasion as, um, you know, the first major armed conflict in Europe since 1945. Absolutely false. I mean, mm. the Balkans, mm. Balkans uh, conflicts, which lasted years and years and years, and cost possibly 150,000 lives, you know, across three, four countries, is within our living memory. You know, this we're talking about the 1990s and early 2000s here. Um, so, hopefully, you know, we pray that Ukraine will 
reached nowhere near that kind of level of death and destruction. Um, nonetheless, it is a very significant watershed and it's the first assault by one armed European power um, across the borders of another in that sense it's, uh, you know the Balkans was a was a, was the a kind of civil war among former nations of Yugoslavia so in that sense it is different um, uh, what we see fundamentally what's emerging as we all begin to scratch around and read up on our European history and the history of Rus and so forth and where Ukraine fits into that is that this is another example of the pernicious nexus between nationalism and imperialism so you know Putin and his many of his henchmen and his elites are um, by conviction or by pragmatism deep Russian nationalists and, and there's a deep strain of Russian nationalism going back centuries you know we, we know that it's far back to Catherine the Great from the 18th century here if not earlier um, and associated with that has been particularly since um, the 20th century but also since since the collapse of communism a deep sense of grievance nationalist grievance you know that russia has been humiliated that it's lost its preeminence it's lost its empire it's lost its its uh, its power and, and and its prestige and putin is the is the visceral epitome of that nationalist grievance and resentment um, but of course nationalism when it starts to uh, put puff its chest out almost invariably becomes imperialist yeah. you know because the borders of the nation um, mysteriously seem to extend well beyond the existing legal territories this is almost always the case it was the case for nazi germany it was the case for uh, you know the british empire for example you know is is a classic case um, so nationalisms almost inevitably spill over into large or small versions of imperialism and this is what i think is going on in, in russia right now and what's more it's not just a nationalist grievance it's an imperialist grievance so it, it's the loss of empire that's at stake and it's the humiliation experienced by many russians that they've lost that imperial preeminence and hence putin's exploitation of this slightly delusional narrative that ukraine was always part of a single nation called rus which you know is a deeply problematic kind of invented history, really, uh, to serve his own his own needs. Um, but it's powerfully supported in in Russia. It's not just the result of his control of the media, although it's certainly sustained by that massively. But it's it's something that's deep uh, in in large sections of the Russian elite and and, and population, um, and that's not going to go away with a peace treaty whatever kind of peace treaty eventually emerges um, that has to be addressed and arguably western europe well europe especially nato has been has has um been hopelessly naive in confronting the power and the resilience and the potential explosive impact of that kind of aggrieved Russian nationalist imperialism. And we have to find a better way in the future of uh, coping with it mm. in a way that does not simply humiliate, belittle and exclude, but provides a way for, let's say, the next generation of Russians. So yeah. those who, for example, are among the middle and younger generations who are caught between Putin's nationalism and you know the sort of europeanism and the liberalism that that some of their colleagues are now aspiring to those who are as it were open to persuasion that that, that realm that generation they need to be given a way forward which is not simply one of belittlement and humiliation um what that form that takes you know who could say but that's that's the challenge i mean those are just some initial thoughts on mm -hmm. On where we are today. Um, I agree that I think even if it was a free and fair democracy, a majority would be pro the war. I agree with that. Because 20 years ago, they were doing surveys looking backwards in Russian history when people had less to lose and giving their honest view. And I was astonished at the findings of surveys in Russia 20, 15, 20 years ago that about Stalin and that a lot of Russians were willing to forgive Stalin for having murdered millions of Russians and held back the population growth and basically made them smaller long term. They were still willing to forgive Stalin because he made them great on the world stage, because he made he gave Russia 
a big profile. And that's really important to Russians. Um, and I, I hope that there's a positive side to it, but all I see is this historical idol of the third Rome, of, of, of being the center of, they want to be the center of world history. And uh, I'm not trying to speak anti the Russian people here. I know a lot of them are heroically, we've seen them heroically standing up against what's going on. But there is that dynamic that it, Putin is, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm a slightly alarmed by the BBC's reporting because they've been more and more propagandist and saying, you know, this is Putin's war, it's all Putin's fault, Putin, Putin, Putin. I think, no, he's actually just doing what a lot of Russians want him to do, which is a sort of Anschluss, which is sort of taking back the fatherland. And, um, it, you know, because um, Kiev is, is very, very important to Russian orthodoxy. It's, uh, you know, it's not accidental. I'm, I'm appalled by this guy, Kirill, who seems to be sort of Putin's court chaplain. He seems the most awful kind of court sycophant, you know, like the worst archbishops in, and popes in history. But at the same time, he's only doing what a lot of Orthodox people want him to do, which is back the program. So the question is, how? what's the antidote? But I have to say, I've been, even though it's all very depressing, I've been deeply encouraged by the so many good things that have come out from it. Um, you know, the, the, um, the way that, as Henry's mentioned, Germany's responded, the way Poland's responded. Um, you know, it's been, uh, and Moldova and so many other nations, um, governments and people, um, not our government so much, but they're catching up. But it's it's um, it's it just and the, the willingness in this country to take in people. We're we're all arranging now to take in a family, and you know I, I just think um, it's showed me that there's a lot of you know once there's something evil to respond to, there's a lot of good out there. It kind of matches the encouragement I've received from Jonathan's book that you know it's not all doom and gloom. That things are actually better than they were 30 years ago in many ways for some reason. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, certainly, uh, you know, the European response has indeed been encouraging across a number of fronts. Um, you know, at the same time, we must bear in mind and confront the fact that, you know, this fantastically generous, uh, unconditional response to Europe, uh, Ukrainian refugees was nowhere near matched yeah. across Europe by similar responses to Syrian, Afghan, Iraqi refugees well, yeah. and, and many others, of course. and. You know, many on the left um, are using this opportunity to, to point that out very severely. And, you know, with justification that there's this vast difference of um, response in the case of, frankly, white European looking refugees um, to, you know, darker Middle Eastern, um, Central Asian, African refugees who find themselves faced with, you know, enormous barriers of prejudice you know the big exception being germany of course which in 2015 and 16 and 17 did indeed open its doors to getting on a million refugees which was an extraordinary response but they prayed the price uh, price for it as well uh, so you know i agree well, let's build on that and so my strategy is let's not spend too much time right now denouncing the west and europe for its inconsistencies but rather once this phase, as it were, reached a conclusion, if it does soon enough, um, to then leverage that recent experience to say, look, this is what you've done for Ukrainians. How about Iraqis? How about Afghans? How about Syrians? Let's let's establish a higher benchmark of moral consistency um, on that score. I really like that as a sentiment. Um, it's interesting. I, I, I jotted down the phrase earlier, hopeless platitudinous wishy-washy stuff, because I felt like that is the sum total of what I have to offer this evening, as I'm a bit over my head. Um, but I, it's funny, one of, the, one of my notes was a, a tweet I saw, which was, uh, the German word of the day is, and I'll get this wrong, Wallstands ver Wallosong, a state of decay that results from having it too easy for too long, leading you to selfishly compare your own petty grievances and mediocre accomplishments to the pain and struggle of people who know the meaning of real problems. Yeah. Um, and I was just kind of, I mean, I wrote that down at the start, really, when the phrase the soul of Europe was kind of being discussed and um, the situation in which we find ourselves in of perhaps not having a, a well-identified 
enemy, I suppose. And I, I was thinking, I guess, a lot of my thoughts were going along the roots of two things, really. Um, popularization about like coming, feeling more like a layman than a, an academic in this sort of conversation. Um, yeah, we're all laymen. Yeah, and but well, not Jonathan. We're even more, inf <laughs> le even less informed than than, than this, this room of people. Um, and secondly, thinking more of, um, I think it's a Nietzschean quote, and I, I'll misquote this, but um, Europe does not know what it means to be without Christ, and a sense of a shared value system, I suppose, from a, a perhaps a Judeo-Christian inheritance. And my thoughts were more towards just thinking along those lines. What do you point out? What 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 compels? What's the heroic journey in all this? And it's interesting to come to this point of discussing Ukraine. And I really like your point, Jonathan, that of course there's far more need um, in a common humanity that perhaps doesn't look European, um, that perhaps uh, I mean, it kind of answers my questions all along of what could be a meaningful outpouring, which is just because we're okay, the world isn't. Um, I think it's, it's a really powerful point that it's not just perhaps the edges of Europe that, that needs um, an assistance in this moment. And equally, there, yeah, now I'm just thinking aloud and losing my point, train of thought, but <laughs> it's mildly encouraging that there is that, that wellspring that, that there is a coming together and yet, um, is there something left in perhaps um, a healthy Europe? What does it? What effect does it have on perhaps even less privileged than those that are blessed by a healthy Europe? Yeah, mm. that, that's interesting. I mean, it, it triggers a number of thoughts. We probably don't have time to. Well, you could segue this, Jonathan, and go back. You're going to have some concluding thoughts about the soul of Europe as well. Yeah, so you might want yeah. to wrap that in. Well, th there is a connection. Um, uh, to what's just been said so so i think you're getting at there one of the things you're getting at indirectly is the tension between say a sort of um a european identity which is introspective and self-congratulatory and protective and a european identity which is internationalist and open and you know generous spirited um, and you know we have we have a tussle between those two visions of Europe right now, among many other things going on. That complicates the picture. And immigration and refugee and population movements, migration is one of the flashpoints of that. And it is it is showing up the deep tension across Europe between those two conceptions of Europe. You know, on the one, the the, the, the self congratulatory Europe, the sort of culturalist cultural supremacist Europe is that um, you know Europe is special perhaps because it's Christian or Judeo-Christian um, that it is distinctive in those regards from every other culture in the world that it has to protect that identity by keeping out others who do not share that cultural origin that cultural or even religious vision hence the deep strain of um, anti-Muslim sentiment, as anti-Islamic sentiment across many European countries. Um, so so th that's deeply problematic. Uh, it, it's, it's not problematic that it acknowledges its Judeo-Christian origins. It's problematic in that it misreads the implications of those origins as a justification for a fortress Europe, a closed door Europe, um, you know, a self-protective Europe. Whereas the Judeo-Christian tradition at its best, and at its best in the Christian democratic movement in the post-war period, was thoroughly internationalist. That was always the case. In fact, right in the Schumann Declaration, you've got this vision for uh, the development of Africa. Way beyond what Europe, I mean, it, you know, way, way ahead of its time in that, in that regard. So, you know, a, a truly Christian democratic soul of Europe would be one with uh, generous borders with a generous immigration policy, the generous uh, and a very generous refugee policy, um, and one that was willing to share its gifts with with the rest of the world, yeah, and make its resources available for a much wider European peace and reconciliation than has so far been the case. See, it's one thing to say um, the EU will look after its own; that's great, you know, but but that's quite a restricted solidarity. You know, there have to be there has to be a much broader 
regional and global vision of solidarity if it is to be authentically Christian. At least that's, that's, a, that's my Christian perspective here. Now, others won't share that perspective. If they're oriented to a more liberal conception, they'll want to keep illiberal people out of Europe. Or if they're oriented to a more nationalist conception, they'll want to keep foreign national cultures out of Europe. That's not, I think, a Christian uh, vision of the kind of Europe that you know I would want to defend. And it's not been, it's not been what Christian democracy has been um, you know, at, its, at its very best. So that's, that's one way to sort of address what the soul of Europe means. Um, it's, it's a soul that has to be oriented to the other, oriented to that which is European and beyond what is European. You know, and rather than simply shoring up a fragile and protected identity and putting up barriers to those out, outside, a generous spirited kind of soul. The other thing I want to say about soul of Europe very quickly is that, um, Henry, in your book, you have some fascinating reflections in that epilogue about what that could mean and you know much of that i'm in complete agreement with um i think the distinction i would draw one distinction here which i would make quite rigorously in faith in democracy which is between on the one hand the societal and cultural level uh, civil society and the, the formal level of the state so you know on the one hand if you can jump on uh, you know a fairly captious point in your book you you, you're opposed to the establishment of the Church of England, but you seem to be in favour of uh, or regretful that there was not a mention of God in the proposed EU constitution. So I see those two as essentially um, on, on a par with each other. Um, so if you reject establishment, right. you also need to reject the idea of a religious confession in a constitution. Yeah, with you. So I don't think I don't think I want to see formal EU institutions explicitly endorsing religious confessions or indeed secular confessions at that level. That I think is beyond their remit and it's a recipe for um, conflict and disaster if we go that route. Um, so, but what we do need is a, and as you rightly point out throughout the book, a a revival of and a creation of new space for the articulation of faith-based visions from the bottom up, so to speak. Yeah. Articulated through civil society, through churches, through organizations, through culture, and you know, a, a, a stripping down of the barriers to the public expression of faith in in all those areas. And I think that distinction is a very important one yeah. to make. So the soul of Europe, yeah. I think, has to be thought of as not a project but almost as a, or rather the revival of the soul of Europe, it's not, it's not a project that any one organization can, can, as it were, take in hand. It's the byproduct of a whole series of, of a thousand different initiatives taking place from the bottom up. And, you know, it, it'll take a generation, two, three, four generations before it starts to, as it were, really reshape the, the, the superstructure and the inf institutions of Europe. Mm. So that's a long term project of cultural renewal that we all ought to be committed to in all the ways that you, you know, yeah. enthusiastically point out in the book. But let's keep the state and the level of government out of that project. That will be my one. Yeah, yeah. Point. I mean, I did, I think, I think I did sort of, I don't know if I put a caveat on that particular point, but I did yeah. talk about, um, and it was actually Richard's point I included when he read it. So yeah, that, that's very good. Thank you. Um, that was. You, is anybody uh, wanting to talk about um, what we've just gone through just there? Well, one thing is that these accusations that it, there's an implicit racism that people have in this country have not responded as positively to refugee crises until now. Um, as one thing is that we have been anti-Eastern Europe. I mean, the, the, in 2010, one of, the, one of the driving things behind why Labour lost was because there was this increasing worry about Romanians and East Europeans um, coming in. And if you remember the thing with Gordon Brown and the granny, that was all about that and it swayed a lot of voters. And, um, but also the U UKIP and the, the run up to Brexit, which and after all Brexit was the reason why it was the kind of story behind Henry writing his book, um, Saving Europe, was as the Brexit voter, he was going back to think, well, what, what you know? What is the origins of this thing we've just left, um, and what reconciliation we can achieve post Brexit? And 
um, he comes up with a very ironic view. You know, his whole book is built on as an Englishman who's voted for Brexit, looking into Europe very positively um, and telling its story. Um, but also, I was thinking there's quite something quite redemptive about the response to the Ukrainian situation in this country because we're looking at the same people that were being rejected by a democratic majority in um, 2010, in 2013, in 2016. Um, and the same people are now being included. So I think I agree with Jonathan's point that there's a heuristic value in any um, sort of, if, if any nation or group of nations can be interested and care about other nations, that's a good thing. And it's a building block for future reconciliation. So it's, it's a good starting point. I think I'd want to say there that, uh, I mean, that there is obviously deep, there is deep strains of racism in, in English culture, British culture. The racism I was talking about was more uh, coming from the top, you know, in government policy. Um, but of course, the two are, in a sense, mutually sustaining. We have to work at work at both levels, for sure. Um, I was hoping to have a Brexit debate tonight because you know, most of us have voted for Brexit and I know you're a Remainer, Jonathan. So I was, I was keen to have that debate as a model of democratic practice. But <laughs> I don't know. Most of you are pro-Brexit? Yeah. I, think I didn't. I didn't know that. You didn't give me warning of that before I entered this, this <laughs> den of lions. <laughs> well, Jeff, and Andy, Jeff and Andy were definitely Brexiters. I was a Brexiter. Henry was a Brexiter. I don't. I don't. I don't mention that in the book. It's not part of the. Story. Oh, you're not saying it. Oh, sorry. Oh, no. I wish. I wish that had come out much earlier in the conversation because I would have given you guys a really hard time about that. <laughs> I know. I am an absolutely unrepentant Remainer. I know, but we. To this we day. But anyway. well, the thing is, what we, we lack the benefit of your tutelage, Jonathan. Yeah. <laughs> um, Call me back for another discussion on Brexit, because I've got oh, unfinished business. Oh, yes, there, guys. Brexit debate, that would be so I've cool. got unfinished business. <laughs> Too, late. <laughs> Too late. We need um, the city boys here for that. We'll probably get their dad in as well. <laughs> she the one thing I would say by way of a kind of a, 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 a gesture of reconciliation is that you know your book is saving Europe it's not saving the EU yeah that's right um, and perhaps that distinction needs to be clarified absolutely in, that's in exactly what we think. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I mean obviously I want to save Europe I also want to save the EU but but it's much more important to save Europe than it is to save the EU that's certainly true I agree with that. I was doing some preparatory research for Henry for his book and um, studying Schumann's life in a French book, you can get it in translation, and uh, Schumann made an extraordinary prediction. You know, he basically predicted Brexit. Um, he said, you know, that we will join late, join the European project late, um, because he'd studied each nation's cultural and legal history in great depth. So he was able to extrapolate from his understanding of the, the trajectory of each nation, and he said, Britain will join late, which we did. I mean, that's partly de Gaulle's doing, of course. But also he said, we'll, we'll stay for 40 or 50 years and then we'll leave. <laughs> so he kind of, he kind of saw, he, he saw it coming. Um, I'm wondering, considering all of that and the link back to Schumann's prophecy, whether we need a part two at some point, when, when we can get you, Jonathan, sometime in 2024, it would be nice to have a part two of this to talk about that central issue because it, apparently there's been a, I thought you knew all this and I there's been an elephant in the room all evening that <laughs> none of us spotted well I have to say I mean I am kind of astonished um Henry that no, you can write a book like that yeah and vote for Brexit that to me is is a mystery that has to be revealed at some well, point I think you've you've already put your finger on it which is distinguishing between identification with European tradition and of the current U European Union as a political entity. They're two very different things. I'm, well, I'm, pa I'm passionately pro-European, but I was anti the EU. Well, OK, I, I, I'd love to know how you can be such a fan of the founders of the EU and yet in favour of Brexit. That, to me, would be a wonderful discussion to have. Well, one word would be Maastricht, but we need to get on to that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Interestingly, I mean, this is we, we had Alan Finster, who'd written um, the book on Schumann and neo-scholastic humanism, and he's um, he was a passionate, um, uh, a passionate uh, European Federation advocate. Um, he, and he actually has articles in The Spectator now, and he teaches at John Vianney University in Colorado. 
and he he went the full other way so yeah he was a Thomist deeply rooted Thomist he went Brexit yeah. I, I was amazed actually so I thought and that was it and for very similar reasons to the most of us as well so mm. yeah I was just trying I thought we needed I thought the EU needs a shock it needs an earthquake in order to behave itself it needs a good slap um, but you know and I, I thought we needed to you know anyway it's too much to throw into a few seconds yeah. yeah perhaps we should do this again I think we should, I mean, I, I wanted to sort of leave it on, yeah, I remember this very specific moment in 1942 in the, the very dark times of the war, Schumann is already talking and looking forward to the forgiveness of Germany. And when I spoke to, Jeff Fountain spoke to a journalist, I think a French journalist, who saw the papers that Schumann had smuggled out, the dossier he smuggled out, of Nazi Germany when he escaped from um, that dreadful man, I've forgotten his name, the Gauleiter Berkel, Joseph Berkel, and in it, it, it scrawled across, which he'd written probably in solitary confinement, with the words, the, we French must learn to forgive the Germans. And I'm thinking now about Russia, and if Schumann was here now, he would already be thinking about the restoration of Russia. Mm -hmm. He already talked about he actually spoke, you know, the, the, the sort of the dream that one day Russia would join the EU. Mm. Um, I think there was a plan for Russia to join NATO at one point. I don't know quite when that was. Mm. Is there anything we could yes. close on? Because it's just, we don't want to be topical for the sake of it, but it does add sort of poignancy to the European spirit in a sense. Um, you know, in East, there has been this East-West divide since the dividing of the Roman Empire, since the failure of the Council of Florence in well, for about 1500 it was, wasn't it? 1490, no, Lorenzo the Magnificent was there. So, yeah, so, yeah I'd, I'd love to hear you guys just speak about if the, the hope, like a hope, um, sort of the dream of a united Europe in, in the sense of the kind of mending of East and West, a post-Putin Russia. I mean, we have hinted at it, but is there anything that we could be encouraging people to do apart from pray? Oh, well, drone strikes on the Kremlin, that would be a start. No, I, it's, it's late. I wonder if we should reconvene. I, I, um, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm loath to not finish on a higher note, that was all. I mean, it was more, because I, I don't think we, we will be able to reconvene. Just I'm concerned for Jonathan's time and he's been, we've actually gone a lot for, longer than we said we would. So is yes. there anything you would just want to add on yeah. that, Jonathan? Well, yeah, I, I, so I mean, I think there's the short term, there's the medium term, there's the long term. Um, you know, the short term is that Ukraine is under monstrous assault from the merciless and brutal nationalist imperialist dictator. Uh, and, and Ukraine has to be defended. Uh, and its integrity has to be protected uh, by, by whatever legitimate means, you know, outside nations can muster. That's that's the immediate short term priority, obviously. Um, and, you know, I, I don't have any technical wisdom on military strategy at all. But that's that's the immediate goal. I mean, the long term goal is, I think, what you just articulated, a way of truly bringing Russia, Russia, the Russian people into, let's not call it the European fold because that that's mm. simply asking them to come, become like us, but to have a common European shared vision of stability, order, peace, justice. Yes, something like that. Um, you know, whether that involves NATO, NATO or the EU, who can say, but perhaps some new mm. structure um, Council of Europe type structure in, in which Russia finally feels it truly is honored and respected uh, by, you know, the rest of Europe and, and, and the West. So that's that's the sort of longer term goal. Medium term, you know, what can we do? Uh, I mean, we need to cultivate whatever dialogue and dialogical relationships we can muster with those who have an influence on these things, including Russian, the Russian people. You know, we mm. we mustn't ostracize and humiliate Russians that we come across. You know, we can vigorously disagree with them if they support Putin, but we must think, you know, how, as you put it, you know, how can we, as it were, act now in a way that forgiveness yes. and reconciliation might be possible in years to come. 
Well, that's what's good about the BBC's obsession with it all being Putin's fault, and generally in our media at the moment, because at least that, me although it's wishful thinking, at least it um, is good diplomacy, because mm. it, it, it gives us a way out. Um, it's, you know, it encourages regime change in Russia, which it seems to me this will end up being, this will end up provoking regime change in Russia, it seems to me. If we can get, if they can throw off the Soviet model, they can throw off this, this kleptocratic state. You know, I, I think if they can do one, they can do the other, it seems to me. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, a number of things have to happen after, after this has reached some kind of resolution. One is kind of de-Putinization of Russia, yeah. akin to the kind of denazification after the Second World War. Um, and that's going to be painful for quite a lot of people. And, you know, seizing Russian oligarchs, yachts, it is kind of small beer. It, it's a distraction, frankly. Uh, it's, it's, it's something much more serious than that. So there's a de-Putinization that has to take place. Um, and that will mean a lot of people who have been his henchmen and enablers losing their positions, losing their resources, losing their status. Um, that, that's one thing. Um, um, but then there also has to be a, um, a, a firm but patient attempt to persuade, you know, that large number of Russians who were caught up in Putin's propaganda uh, to change their mind. I mean, this did happen in post-war Germany um, and, and it was an essential precondition for the reconstruction of, of, of Germany after the war. And something like that has to happen here. And, you know, for, for us as Christians, that has to involve centrally the Orthodox Church. And so the Orthodox, Russian Orthodox Church and its leadership especially have to go through a drastic experience of repentance and uh, and conversion and you know that's what we must pray for in the you know the medium to long term yeah, well, i've been dealing with that online in my in my orthodox protestant catholic forums you know that the inquisiting the orthodox world because it's 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 you know, there's an awful lot of orthodox church politics going into this problem and coming out of this problem mm -hmm. And I was thinking, you know, people who sound like you and I, Jonathan, can't resolve this. It's got to be Russian voices. Absolutely, yeah. Just as it needed someone with the authority of Adenauer to call Germany to repentance, and a Catholic German, you know, I think it's it's yeah. very important that it can't be Western Europeans saying naughty, naughty, naughty no. to Russia, because that, that for the Russian psyche especially, no. that, that won't work. So, no. so the, well, well, yeah, we need to pray. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. For the for, pray for the ortho, pray for the Orthodox Church because it, it seems to me that some of the church dudes in the Ukraine and to, in the last two days Greece have have made the right call. Um, so yeah. I think all, Orthodox Church politics is a thing to pray for at the moment. Absolutely. Yeah, and well, you've probably seen as well. I think coming out of the USA, the, the, the Orthodox Church in in the USA, there has been something that some people are calling something like a Barman Declaration. Um, you know, which was produced by the Confessing Church in Germany in the 1930s and drafted by Karl Barth. Uh, you know, whether that's it, time will tell, but something like that. But as you're absolutely right, that can only come from within orthodoxy. It needs to be said with a Russian accent, or at least a Slavic yeah. accent. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. I don't want to keep you too late because we did say an hour and a half. Mm. Well, that's okay. Um, you know, um, the adrenaline has kept us all going, and uh, that's <laughs> fine. Uh, but it probably does mean that Henry has a harder job in editing back all editing the, it, our yeah. sort of various meanderings and ramblings. And it, well, they do say that this um, long-form discussion is uh, all the rage. Although I don't think that the stats always show it, but I, I think that's wonderful. I think there's a part to play, and you know, I'm thinking of Bookman as well, Frank Bookman, and the extraordinary way God used very small numbers of people to achieve extraordinary cross boundary phrases. Yeah, I think of, just a story. few things yeah. to add. I, is, um, anyway, I loved since. your um, story of Bookman in your book. That was uh, yeah. Frank uh, Bookman's is wonderful story. Episode five, uh, listeners, on um, the, the season two of Saving Europe, that covers Bookman's story. And, you know, I think to Solzhenitsyn's point, and I think Anne Applebaum's point as well, Solzhenitsyn says there really was no Nuremberg, no Truth and Reconciliation commission i think Anne applebaum says something like they almost will totalitarian again to, it ism again on themselves the russians 
because of the deep scar that's still at the it's a trauma scar that there was never you know there was no resolution forgiveness things were swept under the carpet Solzhenitsyn was very aggrieved at that that he could name people who just walked away and you know that kept their factories intact and so there's a lot but the renewal of the church of russia would be you know they need some more father zosimers like uh, dostoevsky's character father zosimer a beautiful orthodox priest that might be a start. Get Russians to read Dostoevsky. That would be a good start. Yeah, but also I think I think a lot of people, our listeners, you know, be thinking that there needs to be there's been some American foreign policy hubris, um, and there's been some things not right also in Ukraine itself. So it's not we're not talking about perfect situations. We've got like a triage of um, incompetency, malice, and and also shifting boundaries. Really, a sort of shifting boundary within Ukraine, moving kind of westward. So it's it's a really hard thing to pin down, but but there's plenty we can be doing. Uh, that's right, plenty for everyone. So, uh, any closing comments? Anyone happy for me just to tie a knot in the, the end of that umbilical cord of that? <laughs> to sever it there. Okay, listen, everybody. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe. We do want to thank Jonathan. Please keep um, keep an eye out, Jonathan. I'll put some links to your stuff in the chat below. It's right in the in the listing below his new book coming out on the um in may which is only like four weeks away almost five weeks so we'll be looking forward to that so don't forget faith and democracy came out last year brilliant book um so yeah thank you jonathan very much thank you it's been a great conversation <laughs> it has thank you for joining us yeah. and uh, you know henry feel free to edit as brutally as you wish no 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 it's fine i'll only edit myself because i'm incoherent Remember also that this journey was part of the research for a book which uses the lives of Columbanus and Schumann to explore the unlikely arrival, survival, victory and atrophy of European civilization. Do follow the links below to find out more. Please let us know what you thought of this episode, what you liked, what you didn't, what was new to you. Just start a conversation below in the comment section. And of course, if you found the content helpful, then we're pretty sure you're going to like this next one suggested here. But also while you're there, don't forget to help us by subscribing to the channel. Thanks for watching.